Just imagine if we implemented into our lives all those things we already knew would make us better. Imagine if we became masters, not just of knowing, but of transforming knowledge into motion. A friend of mine, Tyler, will reach out every once in a while after listening to uh, one of the episodes, and we'll just kind of riff back and forth on the content, chat about the overlaps, the differences, most importantly, you know, how we can each in our own world be a little better, happier, and healthier. Tyler recently built and sold a tech company and is now transitioning into a new chapter of his life. And in essence, starting over, which is something uh, I can in many ways relate to. And this morning I got a voice note and said, man, imagine if we implemented wholeheartedly the things we knew to be true. Imagine if we could execute for ourselves with the same advice that's so obvious when looking out at the world, at others. And I thought, oh man, right? as someone who's spent a decade thinking and philosophizing about this stuff, this is a, a very real and valuable question. Not only that, it sort of comes at a perfect time. And here's why. Right? Those of you who have been listening to the channel or podcast for a long time, you know this, for me, has been one great adventure. Documentation of a journey. Starting with the first video I ever released, Ode to Excellence, which was essentially me promising myself just to give this creator thing a try and not go back to what I knew to be safe. To videos like Running in the Rain, where I discuss my coming to understand the value of identifying as a person who does the hard thing to speeches like, make you proud, where all I'm really doing is, during hard times, assuring myself that things will be fine. To more recently, where sure, I'm finally seeing some of that growth and 10 years of effort compounding, uh, but now grappling with brand new challenges. Right, since day one, I've been coaching myself through the ups and the downs, but what are these stories? What do they provide for me or for those who listen to them? Well, in a sense, they're the lessons learned. They paint a portrait of the ideal. They're merely information. Yes, life gives you more when you ask more of life. And yes, discomfort is often the cost of admission. Yes, you can get through life's greatest storms if you take it one step at a time. And yes, the challenges we face evolve and the context changes, but we are equipped to confront and handle them. Guess what though? None of that information matters if we don't act on it. If we're not using the past to recreate the present. Those stories are my map. But even the best map in the world is meaningless unless it's being utilized. And Tyler's very simple and direct question was valuable to me in that it did two things. First, it made me think, Eddie, look back at your journey. Look what you've overcome, right? In a number of ways, you've learned. You know what needs to now be done. And simultaneously prompted me to ask, and so now, this very moment, what are you doing about it? I love the lesson. I think there's art in our struggle and beauty in the overcoming of our suffering. But if all those lessons, if the ideal remains stagnant like a caged bird, what's the point? That wisdom must be set free, and that only happens with a targeted, deliberate effort. I felt this uh, sense of excitement, invigoration in asking myself, how can I highlight the doing? Where can those wheels hit the road faster? How can I delve further into those very epiphanies I love to explore? Something that I'm encountering now that's both fun and challenging is the transformation from 
I mean, really being a solo creator, speaking, writing, producing in his studio, to seeing the process as a business owner, to building a support structure and systematizing workflows, right? As a, as a friend has said to me before, a little less Mickey Mouse in order to be a little more Walt Disney. And it's happening, but the truth is, right? You don't get where you're going the same way you arrived where you are. So how can the old lessons be turned into action now? Knowing my world changes the second I decide to act is like having an unused arsenal at my disposal. Knowing my foot is barely touching the pedal is power. And we can all focus on that actualization of our knowledge. We can all ask, what's one thing I can do today that I need to, I know that I need to, that perhaps I wouldn't have? but and give myself a little push. I love the idea of that simple diagram where you draw a line straight down a page and on the left side, you're listing your current obstacles, the things that are really bothering you or the reasons you're stuck. And then on the right, one single thing you're gonna do about it. All it does is reinforce action and action is everything. Because to Tyler's point, you know, I really know what needs to be done. We all really know what needs to be done. Not how things will end or maybe what the finish line looks like, but we know now we have a gut sense of what we need to do and where the opportunity lies. We're aware, we understand. So a world where we become masters of doing is a world where we transform beyond our wildest imagination. And the things I talk about, they can ultimately in my life become everything or wither away into nothing. They can sit there as a supposed to, an ideal, and ultimately a, I wish I did. All that depends on what I do with it and how I choose to act when I'm uncomfortable, moving into a new space. The same can be said for anyone listening to this. You're equipped with at least a starting point. You probably know what you don't like. You're probably aware uh, of some things that must be eliminated or left behind. But knowing that is only as good as your first step. So are you willing to partake in the doing? In taking the little pieces of wisdom and breathing life into them by walking out your front door? by looking in the mirror and trusting in your ability to adapt, to change, to grow. In a world of complexity, let's simplify. We know what must be done, so let's focus on the doing. And on the journey, if we misstep or miss the mark, adjust and move again. Because we know there's nothing more tragic than doing nothing at all. I do something today that takes an ax to the tree of stagnation. Not everything, but one thing. When you are in motion, that world seems to conform, to rearrange around you. So here's to giving life the opportunity to make that happen, to giving yourself the opportunity to experience it. As Tyler stated, just imagine if we implemented wholeheartedly the things we knew to be true. Not kind of, or sort of, but with the same or greater intensity, and in many cases, intentionality, it took to acquire the knowledge. What would that look like? Let's move now. Let's swing away. Let's uncover that world where your lessons translate to feet on the pavement and reality in the palm of your hand. You can be your greatest fan and also your biggest critic. In fact, not only is it healthy, it's necessary to be there for yourself, celebrate that commitment to show up, but also to hold yourself accountable for growth. Because to be great is to know there's more in you 
to understand that there's greatness waiting to be extracted from the miracle that is you. Here are two words. I want to take a look at both of them. Consistency and adaptation. Consistency first. Why? Because consistency gets you in the door. It's the cost of admission. Consistency is you showing up for yourself day in and day out, creating mastery and competence through repetition, manufacturing a, a data set that will be used to guide your journey, taking a, a once stagnant idea and putting it into motion. Consistency is doing what you promised yourself you'd do when you said you'd do it. Why? Because that's who you are. You create goals and then conquer those goals. When your head hits the pillow at night, you may be tired, you may have struggled, you may have swung and missed. You may be wondering how things unfolded the way they did. But you showed up. So celebrate that. Celebrate yourself. Be your biggest fan. Because the world can't take your will to step forward and cannot seize your consistency. Not without your permission. So other than part one, let's call consistency the commitment to show up for you. Now the second piece, consistency's older brother, adaptation. See that consistency, like we just talked about, it will get you in the door. It signs you up for the game, but it guarantees nothing. See where consistency puts that pen in your hand, paper in front of you, pats you on the back, where consistency gives you a chance to write your story. One's level of success or achievement relies on their ability to adapt, to do the thing that's so hard for people to do, look in the mirror and ask, how can I be better? I've been consistent for 30 days, sure. Here's what's right, here's what's wrong. Now it's time to adjust, to be critical, to understand that expecting more of the self does not in any way diminish the task at hand. It gives you room to expand into that next version of yourself in a way that simply showing up doesn't. Without a willingness to adapt, you get Einstein's definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results. You get day after day of wondering why this square peg won't just save us all the trouble and go into the round hole. Without a willingness to adapt, we move for the sake of moving and we work for the sake of working. But if we could find it within ourselves to look at the data that's been acquired day after day and use it to help guide ourselves to that North Star, we'll find strength. To seek out the delta between where we are and where we want to be, that is power. But it calls for more than just showing up. It calls for looking around. It calls for observing and then adapting. So yeah, your greatest fan and your greatest critic. Be there for you, but don't let yourself get away with good enough. Showing up is critical. It's powerful, but it's just the beginning. If your eyes stay open, if you're willing to both love yourself and improve yourself simultaneously, all the world becomes available to you. There are no mountains you can't climb or oceans you can't cross. 
And sure, the world will do what the world does. It will place challenges before you. But rather than those challenges being the reason you can't, rather than accepting those challenges as a permanent reality, they become nothing more than the next puzzle to be solved, the next little adaptation that's required of you. You show up, you self-assess, you adjust, and carry right on towards that horizon again and again. So when you find yourself frustrated or up against that wall, remember you are building your ideal reality. Be proud of yourself for showing up, for being consistent. Because as dire as it might seem, you overcame a lot to get here. But also know that the challenge at hand is not an indictment of you or your goals. It's your chance to review the game plan and adjust. Your opportunity to do what so many fail to do, not shrink from the world, but adapt yourself to it. Grow because of it. Today is your opportunity to take what the world gives you and build something new. What if I fall? The man asks, looking nervously over the edge. Oh, but my friend, a voice responds back. What if you fly? A little quote I heard not too long ago demonstrating our proclivity to maintain, to preserve, to protect, to move away altogether from the risk for fear that we might lose our grip on the status quo. Completely forgetting to think about what life could become if things worked out. Forgetting that life is a game of trade-offs. And to fixate on never losing what you have means forfeiting the possibility. It is that simple. To stay is a refusal to go. And we need to constantly reinforce the idea, the truth, that what we aren't doing is a decision. And while we place our energy and efforts on minimizing the falling and the failure, someone else is stepping into it. They're capitalizing on it. Falling again and again and again until they can fly. Because the danger is not in falling, it's in never taking to the sky. It's becoming only a fraction of the person you are capable of becoming with the required sacrifice and courage. It's an understanding that we're not wrong for initially thinking small, playing to not lose, thinking only to protect, protect, protect. That's how human beings arrive out of the factory, right? Stock. And you can thank millennia of evolution for that. You're not weak for being scared. You're not less than for shaking when you stand face to face with the adversity of life. Again, this is what being human is. But what we also possess is the ability to understand these uh, default limitations and transform them. To understand being scared of the world around us was incredibly valuable forever ago. Right When we roamed around hunting and gathering, it made sense not to inquire further when there was a shaking in the bushes. It made sense not to rashly run into the cave. It made sense to fear deeply the prospect of being abandoned by your small tribe that was the only reassurance separating you from the vast unknown lurking in the darkness, the wilderness. But anyone listening to this today must also understand that these biological drivers are outdated. The lions in the bushes are no more. 
the caves are generally metaphorical, and one's quote-unquote tribe should be carefully and methodically chosen, right? Civilization provides that cushion, and what a luxury. So when life pushes back, and it will, and you feel like you're on that ledge, you will want to turn back. Not because you're weak, but because you've forgotten that the voice in your head screaming in fear can't see the upside. It's blind to the possibility. It only sees downside. It only says, hey, this might bring about discomfort. There are things out there you don't know, foreign entities, possibly adversaries. Why would you even contemplate taking that leap? And that's where you step in and provide reassurance. Yeah, things could go wrong, but the wrong steps are one, usually reversible, and two, provide the wisdom that I need. It gives you a chance to inject into the conversation that if things go right, your life changes. That this could be the beginning and that we don't live until the excitement about what life can become if things work out is greater than the fear of what life would regress into if they didn't. Without upside, there's no hope. Without hope, there is no purpose. And as Viktor Frankl has said, life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. We're all operating within the same parameters, same playing field. But the difference is, we have different soundtracks, interpretations, and narratives playing behind our eyes. He may see the world collapsing and spend the rest of his life mourning what is gone, while she may see the same devastation and bring herself to wonder, well, what can I build in its place? What can arise from the wreckage. Same circumstance, different storyline, different result. I often uh, cringe when I hear mindset misinterpreted as this magical thing that becomes reality the second you close your eyes and make a wish. Like the law of attraction, as far as I'm concerned, is not magic. I think this whole song and dance is much simpler than that. We act in accordance to, to the things we believe. And if you believe you're not good enough, if you believe you're not worthy, if you believe more is out of the question, what incentive do you have to change? None. It's much easier to default to hating the world when that's your perspective. But when you can find the discipline, even for a moment, to pause and ask, well, what if things got better? What if my life could be more? That spark has suddenly given you a reason to take another step forward. It's made an argument as to why that discomfort just might be worth it. The magic isn't that you wished for it and so it was. The magic is that you saw it as a possibility and in doing so incentivized yourself to move towards that outcome. It's hard to gravitate towards something that has not yet been built. It's hard to stand with conviction in defense of a life that hasn't yet materialized. But that, my friends, is the beauty and mystery of life. You don't get what you want until you start living like you already have it. Like you can touch it, taste it, like it's real. So when the journey feels impossible, know that you are on the right track. You're competing against some very formidable adversaries, your very DNA. You're competing against the people around you that don't understand. You're competing against the obstacles that make you question whether that conjured up castle in the air existing only in your head could ever come to fruition. That is some resistance. But as you step forward into the haze, your single solitary acts of courage will begin to tell a story, to take shape. 
The once make-believe will become tangible. You'll see the pieces coming together and you'll see yourself as the one capable of assembling them. An architect of sorts, a designer, one with courage and self-belief. The truth is you will never completely mitigate fear. That will be with you forever. It's par for the course. You just need to remember that the power of purpose, of meaning, the value of upside and opportunity is greater than that nagging voice of fear. It's not about closing your eyes to who you are or where you've been. There's beauty in all that. It's merely about opening them to all you can become. If someone were to tell you life is easy, they'd be incorrect. If they were to tell you there's a specified path to contentment, they'd be misinformed. If they were to tell you there's a book of answers to every question you'll come across, they'd be misled. The point is not that life is easy, predictable, or defined. The point is that despite the fact that it's none of those things, you're capable of making something from it. That from a seemingly endless barrage of unknowns exists the pieces to build something truly extraordinary. I came across a quote a few years ago from uh, Abraham Maslow and, and a concept that uh, was in Ernest Becker's book, The Denial of Death. And the idea is we are simultaneously gods and worms. And every once in a while you come across an idea that changes the way you see things. That's definitely one of them, right? A duality that is, is perpetually under tension. Gods and worms. We're animals, we're flesh and bone, eroding by the day. We're given a temporary stay on a giant rock rotating around the sun, while simultaneously equipped with the power to not only be aware of that finitude, but to transcend it, to dream, to see things that are not yet there. Our minds are miraculous, we are both gods and worms. So what do we do about this? How about use the fact that we're going to die? The fact that in many ways we don't have control. The fact that life is messy and unpredictable and often a maze of complete chaos to rather than shrink because of it, take off the guardrails and reach for the heavens to put things into existence that do not yet exist. Why not go all in? After all, the thing about living, as the saying goes, is that no one makes it out alive. No one hops on the roller coaster to constantly look at their watch, to dwell on its temporary nature. No, it's to enjoy the ride. And what is our time here but a few short rides around the sun? So when it feels like life is too big, when the day overwhelms or disintegrates into chaos, don't fixate on the rocky nature of the world around you, but on your ability to take it all and make it mean something. Cherish the idea that although everything around you is dictated by natural laws and constraints, your mind is bound by nothing. 
And where you seek answers, you will find them. Where you pursue more, you will unlock it. Our finitude, our challenges are essential to our existence. They remind us that we have nothing to lose, that the song will end, so why not dance like it's your last time? Because sure, in time we will be dirt for worms. But that's exactly why, as long as we're here, we'll live to, in our own unique way, bridge the gap between the ground we walk on and the heavens above.